From the McCourney Institute for Democracy on the campus of Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. I'm Candace Watts-Smith. I'm Jenna Spinelli, and welcome to Democracy Works. This week, we are very excited to have as our guest Jamel Bowie, the columnist for The New York Times. He visited Penn State at the end of October and gave a really interesting lecture uh, about the audacity of the founding fathers and some of the anti-majoritarianism he finds in the Constitution. And we recorded this interview before the midterms. And so it's it's interesting, I think, given how the election turned out. This is also the first time that we are together since the midterms to think about some of these arguments about majoritarianism and counter-majoritarianism and support for democracy in light of what happened in the election. I think that we saw maybe more support for democracy than any of us had anticipated going in. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing about... Uh, This past midterm is that some people would say that it was the most expensive election for very little to happen. Mm. But in the kind of big scheme of things, we saw that Democrats beat historic trends, which would have predicted a major loss of seats in the House because of the economy, because of the president's popularity, um, but also just kind of midterms as being typical you know, referenda um, around the the incumbent. The midterms are not technically over. Georgia still has to run off its Senate seat. But turnout for the midterms was relatively high, particularly for a midterm um, almost matching rates at 2018, which was historically high. And in some states, 2000, uh, this, this midterm election exceeded Uh, turnout for 2018. And people are saying, and I think they're right in in some ways, that this midterm revealed Americans' orientation toward democratic values. We typically see that midterms are a great time for conservatives to put conservative-leaning measures on ballots because midterms tend to have low turnout. But we didn't see that this time, that we saw that uh, young people, people of color, uh, you know, all sorts of people showed up and in a kind of situation where maybe a majority that mimics what maybe a true American majority would look like, we saw what their preferences were around policies like abortion and candidates who uh, would or would not be willing to uphold elections in, in future rounds. You know, I wondered watching this election if we're just in a new era of politics Mm. because we have this certain kind of expectation about midterms that we kept hearing about in the run-up to the midterm, that this is what happens in midterms Mm -hmm. and uh, the party out of power. But now we're in our second midterm with extremely high turnout relative Mm -hmm. to where turnout used to be. So there's clearly something that's shifted in that in terms of how midterm elections are. The thing that interests me about the turnover, and you alluded to this a bit, and I want to just draw it out a little bit more. It seemed to me, and the data will perhaps bear this out in the weeks to come, that where either democracy or abortion were on the ballot, in effect, turnout was high and it was good for Democrats. And where it wasn't, the election seemed like what we might have expected. Typical. Yeah. Yeah. So I look at a state like uh, New York or or Florida and Mm -hmm. or or Ohio, pretty much. Thank God, this is what we would have expected, you know, because abortion really wasn't on the ballot there. There was no vote that people were making that was going to change the state abortion policy. Yeah. Now that wasn't true in Pennsylvania because if people had voted for Mastriano then right. abortion policy would have changed. And yeah. the same thing in Michigan, where there was right. actually a referendum. And yeah. there, I think we saw a different kind of election, a high turnout yeah. election. In terms of Bowie, you know, maybe we'd come around and back a little bit to this idea of democracy being on the ballot. Because Candace, it seems to me what happened is that in states where election deniers were in a position to influence the election, they, they were voted down. Yeah. Uh, right. In Arizona, Michigan, we could go on Pennsylvania, yeah. lots of other states. But in other states, election deniers still got elected. <laughs> yeah. They yeah, get yeah, elected yeah. positions. Of, so the House, you know, the House Republican conference right now is close to 50 percent, if not more, people that deny the legitimacy of the last election. Yeah. So, I mean, <sighs> That seems corrosive to me, to democracy going forward. There is something that um, I just kind of heard this sound, this kind of soundbite 
And I don't remember who exactly. I think it was maybe mm-hmm. someone from Kansas who said, I, I can't remember where exactly they came from, but you know, they were like, you know, this business of the public voting on an, you know, on initiatives and referenda is like like a perversion of democracy because they are circumventing the legislature. And, you know, I thought that was really fascinating insofar as when we have the opportunity for to see the actual public's sentiments. And so, you know, the initiatives and referenda, right, circumvent those possibilities in some cases, right? There's sometimes that these are just kind of made to the advise advisement of the legislatures. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I thought it was really fascinating for people to kind of suggest that asking the public what they wanted directly was antithetical yeah. to the way that politics is supposed to work in this country. Yeah, well, that just goes back to the old expression, we're a republic, not a democracy. I, I mean, that is something you hear from, well, in our Mood of the Nation poll, we hear it from older conservatives mm. with some frequency. Jamel Bowie talked about it a good deal. Uh, he He's given that... He, He's given that phrase uh, a, quite a bit of thought and has written some columns on it. It, it clearly represents an anti-majoritarian attitude among many. And what you see, I mean, what's so crystal clear, I thought it was really made crystal clear in Kansas over the summer. But I do think that it's really important to emphasize the pluralistic part of that sentence because we've also had a history of where the majority was not pluralistic. In fact, it was homogenous uh, by race, by gender, by property ownership. And in those situations, the kind of suspicion around majoritarianism, my, my red flags go up, my spidey senses go up. But perhaps in a moment where we see an expansion of the folks who are participating and able to participate that maybe we should rethink our kind of suspicions around yeah. major- majority rule. Well, you know, I'll just put in a quick shameless plug. I made a oh, whole series of initiatives and referenda called One the People Decide. So if you find this interesting, I talk about Medicaid expansion and voting rights and all kinds of other things. So you can go check that out. But um, in the meantime, I think uh, this is a good place to go to the interview with Jamel Bowie. Jamel Bowie, welcome to Democracy Works. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, So you've been writing a lot lately about the idea of majoritarianism, but I wonder if we could just start with where does this notion about counter-majoritarian systems constraining majorities, like where does does this come from and, and why do we take it for granted? So I think that within the American context, it comes from a suspicion dating back to the framing of the Constitution, not necessarily the American Revolution, but specifically the framing of the Constitution and the events leading up to that, um, that really saw popular passions, popular energy as being threatening to people's individual rights and liberties. And I think, as I say in that column, there that is not untrue, right? There is a, a great uh, Tocqueville quote where he just like makes the observation that a majority, Alexis to Tocqueville, um, to be specific, uh, that a, a majority acting unrestrained can be as much of a tyrant as uh, a, a prince or an autocrat or whatever you want to call them. And so that's a real observation about the nature of political power, that a sovereign, any kind of sovereign, has the potential to um, oppress people's liberties. And so that insight, I think, colors or colored how the framers designed the American system of government, which was very deliberately to prevent majorities, national majorities from easily forming and then acting easily, right? Think about in our system, if you want to pass, when Republicans wanted to pass a big tax bill back in 2017, what they needed to do was essentially win three sets of elections over the course of like a half decade uh, in order to even be in a position to do this one thing. That That is a, that is sort of an example of how our system 
works to constrain big majorities from just forming in the first place and then acting. The problem, I think, with this insight, especially as it's applied to our system of government, is that it <laughs> uh, it misses the extent to which majorities, when they're large and diverse majorities especially, uh, can act in ways that do actually preserve the liberties of everyone within them. That these, that a large pluralistic majority, um, because it's comprised of many different kinds of groups, uh, is it's possible for it to act in ways that seek to preserve a minimum level of security for everyone in the group. And I think that if you look at American history, you see that actually happening quite often. You see big pluralistic majorities when they're able to form trying to do things to preserve like a baseline of political rights for everyone involved. And it isn't it isn't our counter majoritarianism that protects that in that, that protects people at the mercy of, you know, I, I think I said in that piece, local bullies and bosses, right? It, it ends up being majorities trying to act that that attempts to do it and it's our counter majoritarian system by empowering, you know, what the framers may have called factional hmm. uh, minorities, by empowering those factions on the local level, on the state level, on the federal level to some extent, that stymies the ability to protect um, vulnerable minorities within the political system. And I think that that is just like not how Americans are accustomed to thinking. I think for a variety of reasons from from sort of Cold War era civics education, right, where we have to we have to hype up the American political system as like the best of all possible worlds to sort of like the residual sense that like, you know, states are a uh, your state identity is, is sort of this paramount political identity and you got to protect mm -hmm. it. Like for all these reasons, Americans um, have come, many Americans have come into this idea that if we let majorities act, something terrible is going to happen. And I just don't, I don't think the evidence really supports that within the American system. Right. Well, and I mean, is it, is it fair to say that the, the founders would not have even conceived of or could not have conceived of the, the pluralistic majority you were just describing? Right. I think that's exactly right. That the Founders Republic, the Framers Republic, whatever you want to call it, was a, is a very different thing than even the kind of American society that would emerge 30, 30 years later. Sort of like the 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 republic they created was one for landed, moneyed, propertied elites, where large swaths of the existing public kind of cut out of political representation. There's in, in, in the French Revolution, mm -hmm. the French revolutionaries made a distinction between active citizens and passive citizens. An active citizen was a citizen who had political rights and could act politically within the system. And a passive citizen was a system, was a, a, a citizen who had, was entitled to protections, right? Like they were entitled to the protections under the, you know, the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Entitled to protections within it and within the French constitutional order, but we're not entitled to act on the constitutional order. And our framers had sort of a similar view, right, that certain citizens were active and they were property owning. They were male. Um, they, they were tended to be white, uh, mostly because, like, there just wasn't very many other people in a position to be property owning and landed. And then there were passive citizens, women, uh, enslaved people. Um, many free blacks, natives, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's kind of the world they they, they imagined. And what's interesting, um, in my view, is that within 20 years, within 30 years, the actual American people um, come to have a much more expansive view of who can be an active citizen. And so, you know, by 1824, we're already moving towards universal white male enfranchisement, which is like not a thing that anyone considered 30 years earlier. And this is still within like the lives of some of the some of the framers. Um, by by 1868, obviously, we have slavery it doesn't exist anymore. We're beginning to get to black male enfranchisement sort of within 100 years. And so the the expanding sense of how Americans think of active citizenship, you might say, mm -hmm. cuts directly against how the system is actually structured, which is not structured to facilitate that kind of broad base mass participation. In fact, it's structured to throw like a jaundiced eye towards it, to make it difficult to translate a democratic culture and democratic assumptions into actual political action. Yeah. So how do you think about like layering 
federalism over top of this because it, I don't I don't know if you read the comments on on your pieces, but I read the comments I, I on this not. particular piece, <laughs> and uh, the the most uh, common argument I heard that was you know trying to have a majoritarian system in the U.S. would mean that you know we would be ruled by New York and California, right, right. you know, basically, and I guess. What what do you make of that, or uh, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I, there, I have like two responses to that. I don't have like two. I, ha, I don't have like two responses. <laughs> I have two responses. I had a professor in college who we we it was it was sort of a twenty person seminar for a year. We did like we read lots of great books, kind of thing. And um, the the structure of the seminar is you'd read a book, you'd write a paper, and you come to talk about it. And it wasn't like a debate; it was just sort of a discussion. But sometimes it might become a debate. And a thing he would do is if you said the words like I did, I have like this point, or if you said, I feel, he would like bang his shoe like Nikita Khrushchev or something and say, no, you, you have the point and you think. And so it's just sort of drilled into my head. Oh after. man, I would have been out of that class from day one, I think. And so I always catch myself when I do it. Anyway, I have two points. The first relates, it's, it's sort of a practical one. And this, I guess a comment like that, is referring to say the electoral college or whatnot. And just, just I encourage people to actually sit down and do the math here, just like count up the numbers. Uh, there are not that many people in New York and California, just like straight up, period. California, I think it counts for maybe one in nine Americans, but it's a lot of people, but not enough to sort of control the entire direction of national elections. And in fact, when you think about the actual distribution, if, if, we're, if we're imagining everything breaks along a two-party binary, let's just assume that's the case, and you look at the distribution of uh, votes and voters, uh, in the kind of world where maybe the president is elected through like a straightforward, you know, like straightforward popular vote, Republicans would net huge shares of their votes from California the same way Democrats would because there's so many people. And more broadly, no state, no locality, no, you know, anything is like a singular political community everywhere in the terms of a partisan community, almost everywhere, with very few exceptions, there is a mixed distribution of partisan affiliation, even in places that you think of as being overwhelmingly one way or another. No one thinks of Mississippi as being a particularly, you know, purple state. But 55 percent in, in terms of people who go out to vote, 55 percent tend to vote for Republicans and 45 percent tend to vote for Democrats. That's not some sort of yawning gap. And that that's how things look in most places. It's Five five six four seven three, which is to say that in a kind of national popular vote kind of system, it's not going to be the case that a block of every single New York voter and every single California voter is going to control the outcome of the election, even if that was possible. It's going to be that voters everywhere control the outcome of the election. Um, the state boundaries won't even matter that much because what, what counts are the votes. And so if there are votes for one candidate in one place, it's going to count as much as a vote for another candidate in another place. And I think that state thinking really constrains Americans' ability to think about their political system in maybe broader and expansive ways, which gets, a, gets to my next point, which is that I think the, the fatal flaw of the U.S. Constitution is this sort of divided sovereignty between the federal government and the state governments, which was not, I wouldn't say controversial at the frame at the founding, but there were, there were questions about it. You know, plenty of people, Madison, James Wilson, uh, made the point that, you know, this, this government acts on individuals, so we should, why do states have so much authority within it? And for a variety of reasons, the system we have is where states have a good bit, a good bit of authority in it. And my suggestion, maybe like among my more controversial ones, is that maybe they shouldn't. That the the experiment with giving states so much authority, if the point of it is to preserve the people's liberties, I have a hard time seeing how that's actually worked in practice, um, and that national authority has been a much more reliable guarantee of people's liberties and freedoms than state authority has been. That's not to say you need to eliminate the states, like eliminate state boundaries. I think for reasons of history and path dependency, we're just going to have states. But the idea that they ought to have so much constitutional authority is I think one people should question, especially if we're thinking, if, if you 
by my idea that a more majoritarian political system would probably be for the better. You've also been writing a lot recently about reconstruction and, and maybe that, you know, that is another time when people were asking, yeah, what do we want this thing to be? So can you say more about, uh, you know, how you're thinking about that era versus right. where we are now? It's interesting to me because it is this period of just incredible democratic experimentation because you have to think about what is actually happening. In a period of five years, the United States freed four million enslaved people um, and didn't didn't deport them to another country, which is sort of like the prior to the war. That was the mainstream view is that, well, if we're going to do this, we're just going to like we can't have them here. There was no you know, colonization movement. There was no attempt to sort of like claim land out in the West and shunt them over there, which is another thing that people talked about doing. There was no... At least from the federal government, there was no sense that, oh, I guess we just make these people a permanent kind of like a servile class, not slaves, but like not full citizens either. What happened is four million people were enslaved and then they were freed or they achieved their freedom. And then they were integrated into the political system within like a, within like five years of, of, of emancipation, which is just, a, which is, which is just on a, on a, World historical level, just like an incredible thing to think about. Never happened before, right? That's just frankly never happened before. Uh, and so naturally, as it is, as it is happening, um, as these newly freed people are beginning to engage in politics, beginning to engage in the political system as lawmakers in Washington and other places are beginning to deal with all the implications of this. It's just a wide amount of democratic experimentation. There is obviously a great deal of backlash, um, lots of fervent and conflict and all of these things. And I think that in this period, Americans are grappling with these extremely basic systems about the system in which they, basic questions about the system in which they live. And that to me is what makes the period so interesting because there's like nothing really, there's nothing else really like it in American history of, of, uh, Foner calls Reconstruction a second founding. I think that's right. Sort of essentially refounding the country on a new basis. Um, and there's a lot to take from that in terms of not just analogies, but in terms of looking at the questions people asked and whether there's questions, seeing if those questions are relevant to us and uh, trying to provide our own answers to them. That that gets to another, uh, I don't know, maybe kind of semantic issue on this idea of, of civil war. You were recently on the Argument podcast talking about this question of are we heading for a new civil war, which again, a lot of ink has been spilled. A lot of, you know, uh, podcast minutes have been <laughs> devoted. I apologize. We're going to add to that just a little bit here. But it, it seemed to me listening to that, uh, and, and, and we'll link it for folks who haven't heard it, but it seemed like that it was maybe on, on some level of a semantic discussion about civil war versus other types of civil conflict, civil violence. And I guess I wonder by just putting this this sort of laser focus on the idea of civil war and are we going to have that again, if we kind of miss the forest through the trees or we sort of say we we might like overlook, you know, other other things that are happening or, you know, other instances of civil violence because we're thinking, OK, well, it's not this not a civil war yet, but that doesn't mean that, you know, things are fine. Right, right. No, I, I think that's sort of where I, I, I ended up in that conversation. I think it's where I, I stand, that I'm very skeptical of sort of this whole sort of we're in, we're in for another civil war, et cetera. I just think that's really overheated. I think that scares people unnecessarily. And I do think it obscures a lot of more salient things about American society. I think that we're probably going to see a, this is, I don't know how I phrase this, see a return to more quote unquote normal levels of like civil conflict. One of my ideas that I've never really kind of written about, and I probably should at some point, is that Americans basically since 1980 have been living through an unusual period of just sort of like low levels of civil and political violence. Like there's been some, you know, the Oklahoma City bombing is not nothing. Um, there were you know, a bunch of uh, white supremacist killings in the 80s. I mean, it's not that there's been nothing. But relative to the preceding decades, when you had 
right? In the beginning of the 20th century, like mass riots um, that burned down, like not people, you know, the BL, BLM riots burned down uh, Minneapolis. East St. Louis was like actually destroyed in 1917. And there were hundreds of people who were killed. And that kind of thing was not uncommon. It wasn't sort of a, it wasn't a thing that, it, it, it may happen multiple times in a decade. Obviously, assassinations were much more common. I mean, there's, there was just much more political violence in the United States, much more civil violence and civil conflict. We don't think about clan violence as being civil conflict, but that's what it was. Mm-hmm. And we just haven't had that much of that over the last 40 years. And so I, I do think that we're probably in for more of that. And I think what makes people uncomfortable to think about, and this is, again, why Reconstruction is a touchstone for me, is that... Civil and political violence can coexist quite easily with normal mechanisms of democratic life. That the, there's there's no sharp distinction here. It's all kind of happening mm-hmm. on a continuum, and we are on one end of that continuum versus another one. And that doesn't mean we're headed towards you know all out con all out war between two well defined sides, but it may mean that. There are people. There's a greater net percentage of people, greater number of people, who turn to violence to settle political dispute than there were previously, which was, which would be within like the norm of American, with the norm of American life. The same goes with polarization, with all these things that the levels of partisan polarization are, are high, but they're not. I mean, they've been higher. We've had, we've had higher levels of a polarization in this country, higher levels of division, all these things. Mm-hmm. American society, I think there's this idea that American society was at any point other than the Civil War, like more united or something, and it never has been. This has always been a a big, uh, fractitious country, and I don't just mean that in the kind of like, oh, that's how democracy works. I mean that like in the scary way, like in the, in the way that there, you know, for some groups of Americans, there were whole regions of the country you just didn't go to because they were dangerous for you. And that is, I don't know if like we're returning to that. But I do think that recognizing that that is that is actually the experience of the United States can maybe help you put our current troubles in perspective. Yeah, and you know, I've been thinking too about how the the violence looks different today. For example, in the 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 abolitionist press, you know, publishers have their printing presses burned literally, right? right? But today, you know, reporters are doxed online right. and, and and that kind of thing. So I just I, I wonder. Uh, how you think about that distinction and and thinking about you know civil civil violence conflict in the, the online realm? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I've never I've never made that that particular connection, but I think that's a a right one to make. That that the 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 kind of harassment and abuse and stalking that reporters and members of the press can face are both novel because they're happening online, this sort of kind of new medium, uh, but also not novel because targeting the press has just been a part, it's been part of political and civil violence. You know, there's you know, Elijah Lovejoy infamously murdered um, Illinois uh, anti-slavery publisher, a mob burned down his uh, publishing house and killed him. In the 1898, kind of the lead up to the Wilmington um Wilmington riot. I, I don't know what we call that now. Wilmington riot. I think some college are calling it a coup. Whatever you want to call it in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, one of the precipitating things was a black press that was like, you know, publishing and incin- in, quote unquote incendiary things about white leaders. And um, that was burned down. And that guy had to escape, uh, escape the area. Sort of attacks on press were common during the civil rights era in the South. You know, it was dangerous to be a black reporter, right, um, uh, working for the black press, Chicago Defender or something going down there. So part of the same, I think, continuum, and uh, I think ought to be a recognition that (laughs) the things that were taught in grade school about the American political system, about its stability, about the protection to freedom, all these things are to an extent kind of just like myths. I mean, sort of things are, they might be true on paper, but in actual practice and in, in how American society is actually developed and how Americans have lived through society, it's more myth than not. Um, and if you can kind of see past that myth to see the amount of, Violence and conflict and fractitiousness that has defined American society from the start. I mean, from the from the, if you want to just 
start it with 1776, right? Like from the beginning, this is how this is how this country was. George Washington assembled an army to go march on tax protesters. I mean, it's from the beginning. This is how these things have gone. If you can recognize that, then I think it puts you in a better position to understand what's happening and understand the forces that are driving these things. It's not... The mediums might be different, right? Like maybe it's social people are organizing on social media, which didn't exist, you know, 100 years ago. Like things are different. I'm not saying things are the same. But the larger forces may not be all that different. And I think for my part, it's more important to be keyed on, keyed into those larger forces than it is to focus on like the, the ephemera of like how exactly things are happening. Uh, yeah. And on that point about forces, I want to bring us back to where we started talking about majoritarianism and, and, and building a pluralistic majority. In some ways, I feel like we're in, in sort of a golden age of political reform where people are talking about you know everything from ranked choice voting to universal voting to open primaries, all of these things. I guess, how, what do you think about like... Um, how do we get to that pluralistic majority? Is it is it structural? Is it something that has to happen more in, in culture, some combination therein? I mean, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, I think it's a combination. I mean, there are obviously, there are structural changes you can make that would make, I think, American political, the, the American political system much more democratic. I, I should say what I mean specifically by that is that it's not just majorities being able to rule, although I think that is kind of a fundamental part of it. It is this idea that there are no permanent winners and no permanent losers. There's no permanent majority. There's no permanent minority. That any given election, that majorities, the majority that formed for any given election may just be different from time to time. And that any someone on the losing end of that majority, there's no, there's nothing that says they might not be part of the majority the next time around. And that, to me, is where the American system falls short, in that it does create this situation where you can have a permanent set of losers. And that's just like not, once you have a permanent set of losers, a group of people who will always be the ruled and never part of the rulers, then I think you're in dangerous territory, because I think that leads to it, it does two things. First of all, it destabilizes the system because no one just wants to be ruled all the time. The second thing is on the level of values amongst the people who can lay claim on being the rulers, it inculcates a kind of chauvinism, right? Sort of like, oh, well, this is just ours now. And so when there's attempts to say, well, no, it belongs to all of us, that creates conflict too. So, you know, for listeners who are like, oh, well, you just, he just wants his side to win. No, I want it. I want a world where when an election comes, no one's really sure who's going to win. That's ideal for me, that there's a great deal of uncertainty in the outcomes, and the, the uncertainty is the thing that disciplines everyone. So there are, there, there, are, there are structures that can make that happen, but I do think it has to happen in culture. It has to happen in, in the ways people think about their political system. We treat the Constitution like it's scripture. This is not a new point. It's maybe a little bit of a cliche point, but we do. We treat it like it's a holy document. And one of the things I've been trying to do with my column in my writing is to show that the people who wrote the thing were, you know, set aside the fact that many of them were, did and believe morally dubious things. Like that's, I think that's actually kind of a boring point. They were just guys. They were just people. They were practical politicians. They were merchants. They were farmers. They were practical people trying to solve a set of practical problems within the constraints of their time. And we ought not be beholden to those compromises. Part of part of making that part of sort of our, our cultural and political discourse is recognizing that, you know, if the basis for the Constitution begins, we the people, blah, blah, blah. It begins with an assertion of popular sovereignty. But Popular sovereignty cannot be a dead thing. It has to be live, right? Popular sovereignty has to be a thing that can be regenerated across generations. And if we are going to call ourselves a democracy, if we're going to think of ourselves as a democracy, if we're going to think of ourselves as a country based on popular sovereignty, then we there has to be an avenue, a real live avenue. Like the amendment process that exists now is just like, no, it's not, it's not live, right? It doesn't, nothing's going to happen. A live avenue for each generation of Americans to really 
discuss their constitutional settlement and make changes mm-hmm. to it. doesn't mean it's going to change. I think that if people do revere the Constitution as much as they say they do, it probably won't. But the Constitution's frozen. And I just don't think it's a good thing. I think that a frozen Constitution and a dynamic people leads to us doing all sorts of kludges to try to make that thing less frozen. Um, that leads to outcomes that I'm not sure are good. Should, you know, I, I, I'm on the left. Has in the past, has the Supreme Court done things that like, I was like, yeah, that, that's good. Yes. But sort of on a basic level, is it a good thing that like nine unelected people can essentially change the status quo for a country of hundreds of millions? No. It's not good. It shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> but that's what happens when so, when there needs to be change and there's no popular avenue for the change to happen. It has to, it, the pressure goes somewhere else. Well, uh, Jamal, thank you so much for joining us today. This is fascinating. I hope listeners will subscribe to your work if they don't already. And uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you. Well, that was a great interview. And, you know, for people that are interested in catching some more Jamel Bowie, I recommend watching the YouTube of his talk at Penn State. Uh, What was particularly fascinating about it was he used the first 10 or 15 minutes or so to riff about the uh, Proud Boys event here at State College on the Penn State campus a few weeks ago now that many of our listeners I'm sure are familiar with. And his take on it, which is completely consistent with much of what else he talks about in the interview today, uh, was really uh, fascinating. So I, I recommend that to people. And I mean, the core of that argument and of his argument in general, as I hear it, is that the, the Constitution holds back our democracy. And this is and that it holds back our democracy while the American public has become more and more interested in democratic rule and it, or in, in, in a more democratic system, something which we see in our poll results among younger Americans in particular, a yearning for a more majoritarian democracy. He's making an argument that I've seen from other people over, over the years. I mean, Robert Dahl has a very famous essay from probably... 40 years ago now that entitled how De- oh actually a book entitled how democratic is the constitution and Thurgood Marshall has this wonderful speech he gave one time about why he wouldn't participate in the constitutional bicentennial and i mean common to all of these is discussions about the undemocratic nature of much of the american constitution but we kind of turns this on its head a little bit by saying that it holds back democracy in particular and that the american people are far more democratic than they're given credit for. So what do you think about this idea, Candace, that we should rely less on the courts? As I hear it, right, we'll rely less on the courts to protect our rights and more on the American public. It makes makes my spidey sense a little anxious. I can buy the argument that we should see, um, that we should kind of let majorities have a greater say, that um, counter-majority counter-majoritarian institutions, the Senate, which then has its own special rules to create even more counter-majoritarian protections, the Electoral College, the Supreme Court, and, you know, he makes even kind of makes an argument around states, is, you know, what if we kind of reduce the constraints that they're allowed to provide? But a lot of things would have to be reimagined at the same time. We would have to imagine a situation where if we still had districts, that districts were created fairly and that they were competitive. We'd have to create situations where the electorate is actually including all people who have to be abiding, have to abide by the law, right? So that the majority actually is a reflection of the citizenry. We can have a situation, and what we what we have now often are majorities that are not representative of the citizenry, and in those cases, we tend to see bad outcomes. And so, then we want to have counter-majoritarian institutions to protect. But we also can think of times, even in recent times, I don't past like 10, 10, 15 years, 
when there are unpopular, listen, I'm gonna, I'm putting unpopular in air quotes, majority minorities like um, lesbian and gay Americans who in my own state, um, when marriage equality went up for, uh, went on the, you know, went for a referendum, 61% of North Carolinians, which there's only a voter turnout of 35%, voted that down, that, uh, you know, marriage was between a man and a woman. And so I think that if we had that same vote today, it would be totally different. Yeah, I'm thinking, I, I'm glad you brought up some of the LGBTQ issues. I'm reminded that in 2004, didn't Karl Rove want to put on, put on the Ohio ballot, or had Ohio put on its ballot, a referendum about gay marriage, because they were pretty sure that that would help to bring out conservative voters. And... And indeed it did. And it wasn't until the court ruled that gay marriage was a constitutional right that we saw public opinion really start to shift to where mm -hmm. measures like that were put up for a vote now, there'd probably be more support for them. Uh, although the bashing of transgender rights does concern me that maybe there's majorities out there for the abolition of rights more so than than Bowie wants to uh, wants to acknowledge. Right now, yeah. I'm, so, I'm, yeah. and I think that like transgender rights are one of the an, an example where I think that would be <laughs> actually there's no safe haven for transgender rights. I think in many ways, right? So, I, I, in so far as the the Supreme Court is not going to uh, save that, you know, help that group. Um, I'm not sure that a majority of Americans would at this moment, at this time. You're so right. again, this this is what makes it hard. This is what makes this conversation important to have. Yeah. Yeah. I want to return to your thought about reimagining the Constitution a little bit too, because you know, a point that Bowie makes clear in some of his some of his writings in particular is that the founders did not anticipate the party system and didn't design it in consideration of how a two party system was going to develop. And mm -hmm. I mean I would think that any reimagining of the Constitution has to really take into account how do you break this two-party duopoly mm -hmm. to really have any kind of more democratic outcome? It's not simply a matter of, I don't know exactly what kind of reforms he's suggesting, but you know, limiting the power of the court somehow or something along those lines or putting more things just up for public vote. I think it's a, it would be a larger issue in, in terms, as you say, in terms of how to promote a more democratic constitution than just shifting some decision making from the courts into public majorities. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think that this kind of, I think that it's important for us to really think hard about the flaws of the Constitution and really think hard about the possibilities of making radical changes when we know that they are necessary. I think that Reconstruction and civil rights, the civil rights era, are moments where there are radical changes and for the yeah. better. But you know, we we talk a lot about civil rights in kind of a very narrow way, and then we almost never talk about Reconstruction. I think, and I'm glad that um, Jamal is talking more about them because I think that it provides an opportunity for people to think about: okay, we could be doing this differently. We could have a situation where we have a more inclusive multiracial democracy, and that that situation could be better for more people could could lead to the expansion of rights could lead to the protection of rights and i i don't know i feel like the constraint in our imagination is what gets in our way and and also just his his ability to get us to focus on how the constitution may be holding back democracy rather than the trap i think a lot of americans fall into of equating the constitution with democracy mm -hmm. and they really are two different subjects yeah, so fascinating discussion with uh, Jamel Bowie, Jenna. Uh, it was, it was uh, really a privilege to uh, meet him. From the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Candace Watts-Smith. Thanks for listening. Democracy Works is a collaboration between the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU Public Media. Our editors are Michael Klein, Chris Kugler, Mark Stitzer, and Clint Yoder. Editorial review by Emily Reddy. Additional production support from Andy Grant and Christine Allen. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now.
Democracy Works is a member of the Democracy Group Podcast Network. Visit the democracygroup.org to learn more about our podcast collective devoted to democracy, civic engagement, and civil discourse. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.